Any work of art is determined first and foremost by the materials available to the artist and by the artist's ability to manipulate those materials. Only when those limitations are taken into account can the aesthetic preoccupations be understood. This is Charles Glaire's Lost Illusions of over five by eight feet. Painted in 1843, it's now hanging in the Louvre. Although Charles Glaire was not an academician and his liberal attitudes attracted students like Auguste Renoir to his teaching studio, his highly finished work was typical of that approved by salon and public in the mid-19th century. Lost Illusions exploits chiaroscuro, light and shade, to convey its visual message. The transparent dark shadows and thicker opaque highlights used by Rubens in his painting of the family of Jan Bruegel the Elder show the traditional use of this technique to create an illusion of form. When Rubens painted in the 17th century, chiaroscuro simply meant either the overall fall of light and shade in a picture or the particular distribution of light and shadow on an object to give it a sense of relief. By the time Glare's picture was painted, the role of chiaroscuro in painting was ideological as well as purely pictorial. It embodied a moral ideal in academic art, as did the idealized classicizing figures, gestures, and composition that Glare used. Chiaroscuro had become synonymous with an ideal of universal truth and beauty in art. The moral tone embodied in the chiaroscuro treatment is echoed in the theme of the painting, each reinforcing the other. The monumental heroic poet figure nostalgically recalls his past life and loves, showing the poet, and by analogy the artist, as a noble Homeric type in the classical tradition. The idea of the poet as genius thinker reflects the preoccupation of artists with their role as intellectuals, as thinkers set apart from their fellows by their spark of special genius. This notion, going back to Renaissance times, had led to a split between artist and artisan, between the intellectual and the manual in art. This conflict is apparent in Glare's painting. Its style, handling and composition fall within the tradition of artist as intellectual, while the poor physical condition of the painting shows how cut off the artist was from the sound practical skills of his trade. The physical deterioration of the paint surface is clear when you look closely. In the shadows, the blistering is the combined result of poor materials and ignorant handling. By the early 19th century, traditions of sound chiaroscuro handling had been lost to artists. This was partly the result of the breakdown of traditional training methods and partly because artists' materials were now mass-produced by specialist colour merchants who were more concerned with profits than with quality. Because artists like Glare no longer understood the chemical properties of their materials, their use of colours like bitumen to create chiaroscuresque shadows could actually cause irreparable damage. Without chemical analysis, it's impossible to be sure that Rubens has used bitumen here. Nevertheless, his warm transparent glaze in the shadow has remained perfectly sound. It was this type of handling Glare tried to emulate by overloading the bitumen to give depth to the shadows. Bitumen begins as a beautiful dark transparent brown color but as a tarry substance like asphalt, it never completely dries. In fluctuating temperatures, it alternately softens and hardens, causing blistering and cracking. It also blackens with age, losing its rich transparency. Despite Glare's known concern over sand technique, in works like Lost Illusions, material considerations were in practice placed secondary to aesthetic considerations. But while artists like Glare tried to maintain the chiaroscuresque tradition despite these problems, others, like his pupil Renoir, sought new, more viable alternatives, 
As the critic Huysman observed in 1879, in a new age, new techniques, it's a simple matter of good sense. La Parisienne, painted in 1874, is the same height as Lost Illusions, just over five feet. It shows that Renoir had abandoned bituminous shadows, painting thinly and often with added lead white. Unlike bitumen, lead white is naturally quick drying, so it gives stability to all color mixtures in which it's intelligently used. In Glare's figures, the paler flesh tints in which lead white was used have remained relatively unscathed. Renoir picked up on the advantages of lead white but avoided excessive layering and glazing of shadows. The more layers applied, the more likely the paint was to deteriorate. Renoir's paint layer is remarkably thin, with little reworking, and colors slurred wet into wet on the paint surface itself. The chiaroscuro tradition had encouraged thin transparent darks, contrasted with thicker opaque highlights to evoke an almost physical relief on the paint surface. By contrast, in Renoir's picture, the highlights are the thinnest parts. In the bustle, for example, by diluting his cobalt blue with a mixture of oil and turpentine and applying it with deft descriptive brush strokes, he has left the cream ground to read through and stand for highlights. This economical method reduces the need for a layered build-up of the paint surface. Where shadows were needed, thicker, less dilute blue was used, which is deeper and more saturated in hue. Wet into wet smudging of yellow into blue in the darkest parts deepens the shadows without sullying their purity with browns or blacks. And slurred touches of white brighten the highest lights. This blending of hues on the paint surface is less risky than extensive pre-mixing of colors on the palette. It also gives a more colorful, lively effect. Renoir's skill in handling his carefully chosen, limited range of materials reduces reworking to a minimum. In the glare, two conflicting light sources are used. The sunset, moonrise, which fills the background, is quite separate from the effects lighting the foreground figures. The light on the main group on the boat falls uniformly from above. This yellowish light, with its contrasting deep shadows, suggests that Glare used artificial light from an oil or modern gas lamp hanging above his models in the studio. Overhead lighting was considered perfect for emphasizing classical beauty. So the lighting stresses the elevating theme. The subdued color equates with this restricted light source, which models form through contrasts of light and dark, plus half tones. This chiaroscuro is purely arbitrary, an abstract studio convention designed to give internal pictorial coherence. Paintings are assumed to be read from left to right, so the spectator's eye is directed that way by the frieze-like composition. The lighting reinforces this reading as the eye picks up and follows the key highlit areas from left to right across the painting towards the main poet figure whose inward facing pose closes the right hand side of the picture. Manet, in his studio paintings of the 1860s, like Déjeuner sur l'herbe, abandoned the classicizing ideal embodied in Glare's painting. As Zola remarked in an essay on Manet in 1867, beauty is no longer absolute, a preposterous universal standard. Instead of the overhead or high side lighting common in academic studios, which produced clear tonal gradations, Manet chose a strong full face lighting, which gives broad areas of stark tonal contrast. Half tones are obliterated and the shadows on the nude are reduced to little more than dark contours. Manet's lighting was comparable to that produced by contemporary photographs. Manet avoids thin glazed shadows on the figures, 
the light and dark hues are equally thick and rich. Dark transparent browns, greens and blacks do, however, dominate the handling of the landscape. The artificially sombre hues of both Glare's and Manet's landscapes were contrived under the restricted lights and deep shadows of the studio. This approach contrasts markedly with Renoir's awareness of outdoor light, where warm sunlight casts cool blue-violet shadows. The brilliance and luminosity of La Parisienne belies its studio setting. Renoir worked in a room flooded with natural daylight, falling full onto his model. This one enveloping light source unifies the picture and evokes the warm feel of outdoor sunlight. Renoir was one of the first artists to exploit natural light effects to give form to his subjects. He used contrasts of colour instead of contrasts of tone. A scale of tonal gradations creates the appearance of a form curving back into space. This illusion is the basis of tonal modelling of form in chiaroscuro painting. As you can see from Chevrel's Colour Circle, first published in 1839, pale colours, like the yellow, tend to come forward, and dark ones, like the blues, appear further away. Renoir exploited this in La Parisienne. Where the blue is most dilute and pale, the cream ground shows through. Here the form seems to swell out towards us. Where the colour is rich and saturated, it recedes from the eye, suggesting depth and shadow in the folds. This effect is strengthened because Renoir also exploits the temperature of his colours. Warm and cool colours are opposite each other on the colour circle. Red, orange and yellow dominate one half, green, blue and violet the other. Juxtaposed, these opposite or complementary colours enhance each other. So where the cream ground glows through the blue, it appears warmer, pinker by contrast, and the blue seems cooler, bluer. In Monet's Autumn at Argenteuil of 1873, colour contrasts were also used to model form. The warm colours advance and the cool colours recede, even though they are close in tonal value. So it's the relative colour temperature, their warmth or coolness, which is used to model form. Like Renoir, Monet used a full face light, which falls almost directly onto his subject from behind the artist. Shadows, and thus light-dark contrasts, are reduced to a minimum, and where they do appear are full of reflected blue light from the sky. On the distant buildings, where slight attached shadows can be seen, they are pale blue and close in tonal value to the sunlit areas. The form of the buildings is defined by delicate contrasts, not of tone, but of warm and cool colour. The brushwork, which follows the planes of the architecture, enhances the sense of form. Traditionally, as in Glare's painting, brushwork was blended until imperceptible, giving a smooth surface finish. Texture was created illusionistically. In the painting of Renoir, Manet and Monet, visible brushwork and paint texture play a vital role in evoking natural surface textures. So Monet's brushwork is descriptive, varying in touch from one surface to the next. The sky is roughly dragged in swirling strokes. The leaves are thickly stabbed and jabbed, with tiny flick touches, and final accents added in blues and whites to animate the greens. The wooden end of the brush is scored through the paint to break the solid mass of colour, allowing the dull greyish ground to show palely beneath. Sky reflections are suggested by long horizontal sweeps, applied over the dry reflections from the trees, which are mainly vertical. The detailed handling of warm and cool hues 
is carried through in the broader colour masses which dominate the composition. On a central horizontal axis are hinged the real world and the world of reflections. The cool blues above and below meet along the central line. To right and left, blocks of warm colour dominate, balancing each other. These combine to create a striking two-dimensional surface pattern which vies with the apparently casual naturalness suggested by the scene. Like Renoir, Monet added lead white to almost all his colour mixtures. In addition to helping ensure the painting's durability, it could be used, as here, to bring his colours close to each other in tonal value. Lead white also serves two other distinct functions. First, by reflecting light, it gives an optical effect of pale luminosity to the paint surface. Secondly, white serves as a metaphor for light, evoking a sensation of flooding sunlight. The pictorial construction of lost illusions is traditional. There is a hierarchy of importance in the painting. The eye is directed by pictorial devices toward the main subject, the poet, the key to the painting's meaning. Monet's painting, on the other hand, achieves an all-over pictorial unity. Light, colour, texture, close tonal values and opaque paint combine to give equal emphasis to all parts of the painting. These features are similar to those used by Cezanne in mountains seen from Lestac of around 1878 to 1880. At under three feet wide, Cezanne and Monet's paintings are much smaller than those by Glare or Renoir. Recording the artist's visual impressions or sensations out of doors required often rapid adjustments over the full canvas surface and the overall effect was easier to assess at a single glance on a small picture. Unlike Monet, Cezanne used a high viewpoint looking down on his scene. This tips the landscape up, flattening it close to the picture plane. Form and recession are created through alternating planes of warm and cool hues. Form is emphasised by Cezanne's choice of a side light falling from right to left across the subject. The foreground building shows the effect of the warm sunlight. It casts a contrasting bluish shadow, picking up reflected light from the blue sky. This even shadow adds structure to the composition by defining and anchoring the object which casts it and by describing the ground plane on which the building stands. Unlike Monet's descriptive brushwork, Cezanne's touch has become more ordered and uniform in size throughout the painting. Although this directional, parallel hatched brushwork still follows and defines planes, it also stresses flat surface qualities because foreground strokes are as large as background ones. Similarly, Cezanne's colour is as rich and saturated for the distance as it is for areas close to the spectator. Like Renoir, Cezanne used a cream ground under this painting, but he left it bare in places, a light tone among the darker hues of the opaque paint layer. Pale grounds not only improved the luminosity and durability of the paint layer, they could also be left to stand as tone and colour in their own right, so simplifying the painting process. As well as this tonal role, where the warm cream of the ground is exposed among the cool blues of the skyline, the contrasting colours enhance each other. Impressionist paintings like this were designed to be shown in lighting conditions comparable to those they were painted in. Similarly, dark academic studio settings were designed to produce works that look good in the salon, the main venue at the time for showing work, like Lost Illusions exhibited there in 1843, 
Although the walls are no longer overcrowded, the subdued lighting and dark wall colour remain the same. But if the sheer size of this setting overwhelmed Glare's painting, which is eight feet wide, think what it did to small-scale Impressionist works. They were totally lost amidst this dark grandeur. So one of the chief reasons the Impressionists established their own independent exhibitions was to provide a more appropriate environment for their paintings. In size and decoration, these rooms in the Courtauld Institute galleries are more like the smaller, more intimate space provided by Nadar's studio for the first Impressionist exhibition of 1874. That setting was far more suitable than the hallowed halls of the Salon. It also gave prospective middle-class buyers a clearer idea of how the paintings would look in their own apartments. The Impressionists painted and exhibited their work in natural daylight. Most modern galleries exhibit Impressionist paintings in artificial light. Even here, natural daylight is often eliminated by electric light. Under artificial light, Monet's subtle use of colour contrast vanishes, effectively destroying the picture. Less obvious, but equally important, are the effects that the frame can have. As you can see from this Pizarro, garden at Pontoise, in its original frame, the Impressionists preferred simple cream or white frames to complement their blonde paintings. Ironically, now that they are accepted as old masters in status and value, Impressionist paintings are swamped by obligatory heavy gold frames. These transform not only their colour, but also their meaning. 